Good morning. We are very pleased to welcome you to this fifth edition of the Copernicus for Regions webinars, how Copernicus helps Europe's region to innovate public administrations and the delivery of public policies. It is the last edition of a series of five and we are very glad to bring all the stakeholders together to celebrate for us this final edition. Um, first, we'd like to give the floor to Matthias Petschke um, uh, from the European Commission, Director for Space. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frau Yazi. Dear colleagues from Nerois, Cara Simonetta, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today and to talk about Copernicus and its relevance for regional communities. Copernicus is today the world's most ambitious Earth observation program. It gives evidence-based support to policymaking in the implementation of many policy areas, ranging from climate change to emergency response and security. Satellite-based observation uh, combined with sensor data are the source of hundreds of applications for agricultural and forestry, for environmental protection, for energy and water management, urban planning, transport, public health, civil protection, tourism, and cultural heritage. And all these are very important at regional level. So Copernicus is continuously supporting public authorities. Uh, to find solutions to challenges. We think of spatial planning, civil protection, water management, environmental monitoring. Also as a shared system, it produces common benefits across Europe. Let's think of brownfield mapping in Volunia, uh, afforestation monitoring in Thüringen, uh, public utility management in Denmark, farmland monitoring anywhere uh, uh, in, in, in Europe. And Copernicus guarantees actually also that this information can be stored and kept available at the highest quality to be used as a reference also later. We closely work as European Commission with the user communities. And we know that Copernicus gives critical information to users for them to exploit it and to use it in full autonomy and confidence. And by this, Copernicus empowers public authorities, including the regions, and strengthens them in the development of their own environmental policy implementation in their own control and reporting tools. And what is more, Nicholas also fosters the emergence of added value downstream services by the commercial sector, and thus in turn contributes to the development of space industrial ecosystem. So we have, we believe, very positive impacts on the public sector, but also on the economy at large. As most of you know, we have currently eight satellites in orbit. They are all operating nominally except for one. And you might have heard that one of our radar satellites, the Sentinel-1B, has recently encountered an anomaly. And the European Space Agency, which is operating the satellite on behalf of the EU, took immediate action. And I want you to be assured that we are taking the colleagues in ESA, but also together with us, we are as a program doing everything we can to mitigate the impacts on the users. The identical satellite Sentinel-1A, which is also in orbit, is operating nominally and has just been successfully used to monitor the impacts of the Tonga Volcana eruption. This is a reassuring sign of continuity. Also, 
uh, we compensate as much as we can with additional data acquired through the Copernicus contributing missions. Let's turn a moment to the future. There is more to come for the future of Copernicus. We plan ambitious expansion missions that will give us more observations, notably, but not exclusively, for CO2 monitoring purposes. Uh, there will be a better monitoring of vegetation, for instance, and notably also of the Arctic area, which is becoming more and more relevant for a variety of reasons. We will also onboard more and more new space solutions. We want to modernize Copernicus, making sure that Copernicus remains in the future as relevant for users worldwide as it is today. For the implementation, the European Commission signed a contribution agreement with ESA in June last year. And uh, initially, we would have hoped for a higher budget through contribution from third countries as participating, participating states in Copernicus. But we have now adapted our programmatic planning to the budgetary boundaries while keeping the ambitions and the integrity of the program. Let me finish by thanking you for your excellent work, colleagues of uh, NEOROIS. This is an excellent network. Uh, I uh, understand from the various exchanges we already had in the past that you are an important user, an important multiplier also for us, and certainly one of the key stakeholders on the ground in the regions. Thank you very much for your very proactive role in cooperating with us at program level. I wish you uh, all success uh, for this uh, seminar today, for this webinar today. Uh, bonne continuation. Herzlichen Dank. All the best. Thank you very much, Mr. Petschke. We were very glad to have you here this morning and appreciate the cooperation with the European Commission. Now I move on to um, the European Space Agency, the second commission, uh, the second cooperation partner. Um, a warm welcome to Simonetta Kelly, Director of the Earth Observation Programs at ESA. Please. Good morning, Roya. Good morning to all the Nereus colleagues and friends. Uh, good morning, Matthias. Uh, I'm the new Director of Earth Observation at ESA. I've been working on this uh, collaboration with Nereus a long time. And in this new role, I'm very happy to be here today at the closing webinar. I see that a lot of the partners, public administrators, scientific, technological experts, decision makers are connected here in the audience. And I would like also to thank all the speakers who will present their stories. And their stories is what is important today in this context of Nereus. It's always the stories, the successes, that tell us how Copernicus is actually a success story for all of us, for Europe, for the fact that it has free and available data that everybody can use and benefit of. Uh, let me allow, allow me actually to thank, of course, the European Commission, the European Commission provides the political leadership and the lead uh, to such an important program, Copernicus, and also it helps in addressing all the uh, important societal needs, which are the priorities for, for the Union. Thanks to Nereus, uh, with whom, as I said, we have a long-standing collaboration. You actually provide effective links to a community at regional level of public authorities that among um, the core users of Copernicus. Copernicus is today, as Matthias mentioned, a, a suite of satellites, the Sentinel missions. We have eight in operation. One is actually facing an anomaly, as it was just mentioned, and we have many more to launch in the coming years. It's the most diversified operational Earth observation program in the world, and it's a huge success, as I said, for all of us. Data from the Copernicus Sentinels, which are developed by the agency, feed into the services, the Copernicus services. And those services are the ones that help to address challenges such as urbanization, food security, rising sea levels, diminishing polar ice, natural disasters, and of course, last but not least, climate change. So we want to ensure altogether the continuity of this data for the benefits of the users. And in fact, we're currently developing the next generation of the Sentinel satellites, which address specific user needs. 
is a it's at the center of innovation and we actually always look at new systems and the expansion mission are doing that in the sense that they looked at new user requirements additional ones and technology solutions to meet those requirements innovation is part of visa dna we have many initiatives to support innovative exploitation of EO data, not only Copernicus, but also of other ESA missions. We plan to continue to accelerate this in the future. And we would like also to uh, work on the new space topics. On, we are developing small sets. We are developing and working uh, on a collaboration with new uh, commercial initiatives that are also going to become part of the future of Copernicus. We have a firm commitment with Copernicus, uh, jointly with the European Commission. You heard from, from Matthias, we work daily together, even on situations where you face difficulties, like, for example, how to meet user requirements at best in an occasion of an unknown. We live today a digital age that relies on data, and Copernicus Space Component is the leading provider of data from space on the state of the planet. Copernicus must first and foremost ensure continuity of data and services. And uh, this is something that we all remind, it was reminded to all of us, uh, and you can never take it for granted, for example, when we had the Sentinel 1B anomaly. For ESA, it's very clear that operational systems need continuation, reliable data flows, and support to applications now, but also in the future. We are committed in the agency to work with all our partners the Commission, UMATSAT, the industry, the scientific community, the users, to developing further and implement further the future of Copernicus. The Copernicus missions are also fundamental tool to support the European Union priorities. As I said, climate change, but also the Green Deal, with all what is linked also to the decarbonization of Europe in 2050. It's an ambitious program and needs activities to be planned long time ahead. And we're already designing the evolution of the next Sentinel missions. The next generation Sentinel missions, the expansion one, will ensure, in fact, enhanced continuity of today's application. We will support decision makers to reach, as I said, the carbon neutrality. And we really want to contribute with space solutions and space tools and space data to the benefit of all the European citizens. Copernicus for the Region initiative shows us that to what extent the regions have managed to understand and identify the positive model case at the regional level and the potential and the great potential that exists in the exploitation of the data coming from Copernicus. Copernicus for the regions provide user stories, lessons learned, and crucial evidence about the benefits provided by Copernicus, which is of fundamental importance to sustain the program for the future. So you have an essential role in that respect and an essential story to take and to tell about how important it is at local level also the exploitation of such data. I hope that the exchanges you will have during this webinar will be fruitful and will be fruitful for the Copernicus community at large. And I wish you good work during this webinar and for the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Simonetta. Um, now um, we move on to the to the Nereus um, uh, president, Mr. Thierry Coutel, a regional politician from the French region of Occitanie. And Mr. Coutel is a member of the regional council in Occitanie and works also on space topics, on topics that concern climate change. Please, Mr. Coutel, the floor is yours. Much we are. Uh, dear member of the European Parliament, uh, Svelettina Penkova, I hope it's a, a good pronunciation. Uh, dear Marku Markula, dear Matthias, dear Simonetta Shelley, and dear ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, with a great pleasure we welcome you to this uh, last edition of a series of uh, five Copernicus IV Region webinars. First, I'd like to, um, to take to the side the opportunity to uh, thank uh, our partners, the European Commission and the European Space Agency, but also the public user representatives and the Copernicus IV region offers for their kind cooperation and support to this joint initiative. Excuse Please. me, Mr. Kotel, could you yes. open the camera? Is this possible? 
Oh, sorry. I didn't do it. So Is that okay? We can't see you yet. Sorry. Trying to do it. I know, I can't do okay. it. I'm then sorry. we move sorry. on. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm very sorry. You can you can see my face. Sorry. Then we just move on with the speech. Please. It is even more impressive with the black screen. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem. Please. No, I'm very, I'm very sorry. I can't do it. I don't know why. No problem. Please. Okay. So I said that in, on this occasion, uh, I like to um, to recall that uh, Copernicus for Regions is a great accomplishment of volunteers across Europe, and thanks to, so for uh, sharing uh, your experiences and uh, viewpoints and your commitment. Uh, without saying too much, we succeeded in building a lively Copernicus region community that brings together the broad spectrum of regional and local user with a unique interregional approach and created a reference for best practices at the regional and local level. Uh, bringing these important user experiences to the European Parliament, to the commu community committee of the region and the political level of our region to debate the societal and social economic dimension of sentinel imaginary and difficulties of uptake was a key further of the initiative. In this respect, I'd like to thank uh, our interlocutors for engage, engaging with us uh, in a di dialogue and I look forward to further debate. This final edition of Copernicus for Region webinar today built on the previous edition that cover a range of regionally, regional policy priorities ranging from forest, forestry, resilience to climate change, biodiversity, prevention and uh, preparedness to natural disaster, and brings new user stories to the stage that focus on public sector innovation. The different user portraits from the local and regional level so far not only illustrate that the Copernicus system is, is uh, successfully applied in a wide range of uh, public policies, but gains even more significance as uh, an integral tool for the policy ambition around the green and uh, digital transformation of Europe, but also over hatching policy challenges such uh, as uh, uh, mitigation to climate change, responsiveness uh, to civil emergencies, and uh, addressing the COVID crisis in terms of resilience and recovery. Here, the local and uh, regional level plays a vi vital role as the level close uh, to the citizen, while, uh, while uh, integrating different axes of uh, environmental, territorial, and regional development policies. At this stage uh, of the project, we uh, focused not only on successful best practices of Copernicus uses, but um, explored the further path of these uh, user stories three years after the launch of the Copernicus for Region publication in 2018. We wanted to learn more about the developments and trends at the level of public administration 
to better capture the uh, uptake situation. We were very glad uh, about the positive uh, si signals uh, that the consultation of public administration revealed. More details to this point later by uh, our publication uh, manager, Ms. Branka Kusha, uh, whom we uh, thank uh, sincerely for her uh, excellent, uh, excellent work. However, despite the positive signals and advancement on different levels, we are far from uh, systematic uptakes across Europe. The use of Copernicus information and services within public administ administration is still dispersed across Europe. Public administration have uh, different levels of awareness and uh, maturity, while uh, administration in highly speciali specialized and industrialized region tend to benefit to a larger extent for, from, uh, from the system. Given the number of potential uses of the system for public policy needs, the actual used, uh, uses made of uh, Copernicus are much smaller. So this has, uh, of course, to, to change. Here, um, a more coherent approach taking into uh, account the world legislative and public policy framework, as well as a um, fairer balance and cohesion, have to be promoted. Therefore, we call the European Commission and the Copernicus stakeholder community to launch a comprehensive European uptake strategy to ensure that citizens can optimally benefit from uh, the system regardless of which region or country they live in. From um, a regional uh, perspective, interregional inter cooperation and, back and best practice uh, sharing, successful uh, approach to overcome obstacles and burdens, identify key success factors, public uh, procurement, broader dialogue with uh, relevant user communities and bringing experiences and viewpoints of the regional level to uh, the Copernicus user forum are crucial to expanding the scope of user communities and usage. The topic of today's webinar, namely uh, public sector innovation, should be a core piece of such a strategy. We um, identified uh, tangible examples that show how Copernicus information and services contribute to uh, modernizing the public sector and the delivery of public policies. The public sector, with its broad thematic scope and the outreach, in, is particularly suited to highlight the innovation capacity and performances of space to our society. Model project innovating public administration have strong visibility and a high societal value to show the benefit and engage politician and decision maker in public administration and thus help to shape the uptake situation and space reality in Europe. So as um, I say, I'm uh, myself a politician uh, of a French region, uh, the region Occitanie, deeply involved in, the, in space, uh, and uh, I, I look, of course, forward uh, to hear today's user testimonials. So thanks very much for your interest, and uh, again, thanks to, uh, to our organization and to uh, especially to the the Nereus team. Uh, I'm uh, I'm very glad to uh, to uh, to say that uh, they are they, they do a, a lot of work and uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's very interesting for all of us. Thank you and and very sorry uh, because you didn't look my face and uh, I don't know how to uh, uh, to uh, to put on the, the the camera. Sorry. Thank you so much. We were very glad to have you here, Mr. Kotel. We now move on. Um, still on the regional level, we are very um, happy to welcome Marco Makula, the former president of the Committee of the Region, um, the president of the Helsinki region, to share his views on public sector innovation. Please, Mr. Makula, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a bit politicized uh, politics on, on this uh, situation where I'm actually, this is the uh, uh, Council, EU, European Council building in the French uh, uh, delegation meeting facilities because in 
20 minutes time I'll be contributing an, about the European missions to all the member state uh, representative from uh, and, and then uh, even in this case I li listening to what uh, Ma Matthias Petschke said and what the others have already contributed so let me add a couple of the important issues from the regional perspective and I, I link really this strongly now to the European missions because as everyone knows so the the missions will be a strong new and vital instrument for the future of Europe. The political decision makers need to get that going actively through and reach the ambitious targets of the missions. And if we take especially the climate adaptation mission, but if as well we take uh, the one on soil, uh, uh, oceans and water, so all are related to the importance of, of data. And collecting data with the sensors and measuring systems, so satellites, the whole space technology, and the spin-offs are coming out of that, uh, they play a very crucial role. So we need and to reach the targets of these five missions. So in each of those, so we need to really focus strongly on the, the, the uh, role of cities and regions with all the stakeholders and citizens, but integrate this uh, to the new developments in science and technology. The, as commissioners, several have all the time stressed that these missions will be a totally new initiative under the, the horizon, so it's, it's strongly connected with the technology and research and development and innovation, but it, it needs to be a bottom-up. So regions and cities, rural and urban areas play a crucial role. And then when we think about this, even if we think about the, the, uh, the, uh, the conference on the future of Europe and, and what are the political decision makers and citizens talking in the different uh, both the working groups and general conference. So they all the time tackle uh, or highlight that we need to tackle the burning societal challenges. And on this now, this uh, emissions, because now in the EU budget, there is 1 billion euros devoted already at this stage for each of those five missions. And in addition comes from cohesion funds, from recovery funds, from EIB, from and especially from public and private investments a lot. So it's a huge financial initiative as well. And uh, linking that now then uh, to the uh, uh, topic of today, so I want to stress that uh, especially the satellite-based data and services address almost all policy domains, definitely on the Green Deal, uh, and that means as well then on these uh, future missions. Uh, as such, space technologies, I know it personally as well, I've, I've been participating in several uh, Copernicus events and with the Parliament, uh, with the NEREOS, and as well uh, been familiar with the uh, European Space Agency, including their special work uh, in, in my own home city, ESPO, the University of Alto, there. So uh, the space technologies, so it's not just those uh, fancy uh, mission satellite, but, but uh, they can really be on many, many ways to support the full horizontal wide of the Green Deal. For local and regional authorities, this is especially important in areas where they have competencies such as promoting sustainable mobility or looking for zero pollution, being it uh, soil, uh, water or air. Um, satellite services can be a critical component in monitoring the success and that's why we need to do in every region and in the European scale, we should do much more collaboration now with the uh, very specialized companies who develop those systems for uh, reaching the targets of the missions. I've talked 
uh, several times with, as an example, with the representatives of the Vaisala company, a traditional long-standing, uh, long-term uh, uh, specialized company in Finland on all the uh, sensoring and measuring systems, how on the regional level, how we develop now the, the uh, use of different technologies uh, 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 to collect, the analyze uh, and the data regularly coming from the infrastructure, but as well from soil, air and, and water uh, forests included. So this is, this is really crucial. But if we especially look at the climate adaptation mission, so all those disaster uh, related topics, we need the, er, let's say, the early warning signals and for that work. So we definitely need, need the, the, the uh, use of all what, what is already done by you or the representatives of this, let's say, grouping. And, and in our opinions, Committee of the Region opinion for the, uh, the missions, we stress heavily that the, uh, we need to increase our European competitiveness, we need to foster the technology, technological sovereignty in key strategic areas such as artificial intelligence, robotics, cyber security, all the data economies, and then uh, you all are key players on that. And then we go to the modern uh, new solutions on the local level. Uh, and especially then definitely in this uh, climate adaptation mission, so this uh, disaster risk reduction all related to that, they are one of the very crucial focus points of that to move ahead and use the different uh, new developments. And then if, uh, let me just conclude that uh, when looking this from the regional perspective, uh, regional policy makers, we are not uh, yet in depth in this, let's say, evidence informed policy making. And, and so we need the, the results, but as I followed several years on this new developments and uh, what's been done in, in let's just take examples from Spain and Italy where a lot regional uh, developers are interlinking satellites and all related technologies to their political decisions making so we need more this kind of bench learning for the other regions and, and we know that in the Baltic uh, states or in Nordic countries, we have a lot of excellent uh, uh, companies, businesses operating together with research centers and universities and producing, but we've not been able to embed all these issues enough to our political decision making. And that is my, uh, let's say, conclusion and address to you that uh, let's collaborate and find ways how uh, you all can be in, more influential in implementing uh, the European missions because they are so uh, crucial for the future of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, warm thank you to the um, very inspiring words by our regional politicians and by the representatives of the European Commission and the European Space Agency. Um, we appreciated your presence. It gives us food for thought and we look forward to channel your messages in our community and continue the dialogue. Now we move on with Copernicus for Region, which is um, um, picking up the words of Mr. Markula, a unique um, interregional cooperation at a European scale. And sometimes words can say a lot, but images can say much more. And we like to share these images with you, please. Did you know that the Copernicus program with its Sentinel satellites is supporting public authorities to improve our lives on a daily basis? 
Para mí, los datos de Copernicus y sobre todo en específico Sentinel-2, los satélites, son los nuevos ojos de las regiones costeras. I dati Sentinel inoltre sono dati aperti, sono disponibili a tutti gratuitamente e questo per noi è un grandissimo vantaggio. Copernicus data are increasingly being used by local and regional authorities across Europe. Does your public administration make use of Copernicus data? Copernicus for Regions is a joint initiative between the European Commission, the European Space Agency and the network of European regions using space technologies that provides practical examples on how public administrations across Europe use Copernicus to deliver benefits to their citizens. The initiative is based on a collection of users' stories with a strong focus on public authorities. Public authorities are key users of Copernicus data. Without uh, Sentinel data, it's very difficult or nearly impossible to validate an avalanche forecast. We need people out in the field to uh, observe avalanche activity, which is often prohibited by, by poor weather conditions or the absence of daylight, especially in northern Norway. We can monitor landslides more frequently over wide areas simultaneously, providing wider picture as uh, conventional traditional methods could take. L'utilisation des nouveaux dispositifs mis en place nous permet un suivi très précis de l'évolution de cet urbanisme et nous permet de mettre en œuvre de nouvelles solutions en termes d'aménagement du territoire et d'urbanisme pour développer le territoire tout en préservant la nature. Les crises des épisodes mieux les coûts pour le politique parce qu'ils mieux les conditions pour les élections et les élections ιδιαίτερα σε δύσβατες περιοχές ή σε περιοχές που είναι δύσκολη η πρόσβαση, όπως είναι τα μικρά ελληνικά νησιά. Κομπρέντερε οι εφέτοι σε αυτές τις καμπιαμένες προδούκων στους λιάβητες και στους πέσεις δεν είναι αφατο σέμπλησε. Κάρο και λούζο δεν είναι σατέλλητοι, είναι ούτω ενόρμη, ότι είναι ενδυσπενσάβηλε για να μεζουράρει σημαντικά οι καμπιαμένες και οι εφέτοι και να έχουν σύρια τεμπορά Copernicus for Regions is about sharing knowledge and experiences across Europe. Copernicus for Regions also helps regional authorities to interact and share their experiences with citizens, politicians and policy makers, and in doing so, shapes the future of the programme. Copernicus for Regions is about supporting and growing the community of Copernicus regional users. You can read and watch how public administrations across Europe used Copernicus to address a variety of challenges and modernize their services. Would you like to join the ever-growing community of Copernicus users? As you could see in the film, Copernicus for Regions is about community building, is about sharing knowledge and information, is giving you a unique best practice collection and making activities at the regional level more transparent. Um, we invite you to visit our website where you will find a wide range of different tools 
native language material, videos, the publication, single info sheets for topics, and um, you can choose what uh, uh, suits you best. Um, now I like to move on and um, introduce you briefly Mrs. Alessandra Tassa, our project responsible at the European Commission. And um, Margarita Krisaki, who worked um, with us from the Nereo side on the uh, initiative. The colleagues from the European Commission can't be unfortunately with us today. Mrs. Um, Theodora Antonino, our warm regards. Now I'd like to give the floor to our moderator, Mr. Jamie. Barry Hill, um, Jamie from the OACD. Um, please, um, Jeremy, maybe you can also, you are an innovation specialist at the OECD. It would be nice if you could briefly tell us what you are doing, what is your perspective on public sector innovation, and guide us through the program. Please, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Roya. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Berryhill. I'm with the OECD's Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, or OPSI. Uh, and at OPSI, we work with governments around the world to understand and adopt new approaches to improving public sector efficiency, effectiveness, and responsiveness um, by empowering public servants with new insights, resources, and connections. Uh, and just in general, uh, Copernicus and Copernicus, Copernicus for Regions um, is really kind of a great example of the type of approaches that we work with uh, governments to diffuse across the globe. So I'm really excited to uh, be here to serve as your moderator to help guide through the rest of the program. Um, and, you know, Copernicus it, it falls in line with a lot of what we try to do at the observatory. Uh, it, you know, Copernicus, Copernicus yields tremendous data that governments can leverage for innovative approaches to things like uh, disaster response and urban planning. Um, one of our biggest focus areas at OPSI is taking systems approaches to major challenges, including global challenges, and, and through the Sentinels and, and the data coming from them, we can really see Earth as, a, as an interconnected system uh, in, in, hold, in completely new ways. Uh, and we're really excited to see how governments are taking this data uh, and using it to understand global ecosystems um, rather than just, just local ones or even organizational ones. Um, and another one of our main focus areas uh, in OPSI is cross-border government collaboration. Um, so, which Copernicus for Regions is really enabling and supporting at a large scale. So, so these are just kind of a few of the ways that we see Copernicus and Copernicus for Regions serving as a, a beacon demonstrating the potential of what can be done for, for the rest of, uh, for public services around the world and, and within the EU, of course. Um, so, uh, we're really uh, happy to be participating. And I don't want to... For the sake of time, I want, I'll just keep things moving along. So I believe that next up, uh, or first up, uh, we're going to have a video presentation from Dr. Branca Kuka of the Politecnico de Milano on key findings from Copernicus for Region survey. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to the video presentation, but quickly I wanted to mention, um, there should be a chat option uh, and we welcome questions throughout uh, all of the presentations. We'll have a couple of rounds where we'll take a pause and, and take questions from the floor. So please do feel free to drop any questions that you have and, and we'll pick them up as we go along. But uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The title of my presentation is Copernicus User Stories Three Years On. What can we learn? I would like to introduce to you Arthur. My colleague and a dear friend that works at a big, big European municipality as a technical staff at Urban Planning and Management Office. I didn't see Arthur for so, quite some time and he wanted to know what, have I, what am I up to. I informed him that I'm working on Copernicus for Regions update activities and he wanted to know more. He correctly remembered that this, this is a follow-up of 99 Copernicus user stories published back in 2018. Firstly, I wanted to inform Arthur's, Arthur on whys and hows of our update activities. We wanted to investigate if and how 99 user stories have evolved, and our main objectives were to understand if new applications have emerged, if the sentiment-based solutions were incorporated to the flow of the daily administrative process, if the space solution became institutionalized, and if the portrait space solution made it to the market. 
Arthur was interested. He wanted to know if regional and local authorities can benefit from this survey. Well, until now we have received 54 replies on evolution of the user stories. So at the moment we can identify three main outcomes. First of all, we have an overview of positive technological achievements and experiences of public administration. We also have positive and less successful examples in other regions, important food for thought for overcoming difficulties at all decisional levels. We can also maintain a live and active Copernicus for Region community by promotion towards new audiences, possible new service users and peers. Arthur was very interested, but he wanted to know also about a bigger picture. I found that to be a very good question. I invited Arthur to think that he can find some examples on updates of Copernicus-based solutions dealing with sustainable and uh, development goals and Green Deal objectives. But most importantly, an updated collection of this kind allows regional and local authorities across Europe to speak a common language on shared problems. Arthur was almost convinced. He asked me about some key messages. Well, in term of, terms of technical advancements, small applications have improved mainly in automatization and performance, more than 25%, but also many implemented the service of additional Copernicus data and services. Arthur wanted to know about benefits of, to the society and the European citizens. I was very happy to inform him that the benefits to public authorities and European citizens were our main concern. We have investigated benefit, benefits across six different domains, economic, environmental, regulatory, innovation, science and societal domain. In more detail, in regulatory domain, we found public authorities to be facilitated in the compilation of institutional reports for more than 40 percent of respondents. In science and technology domain, there was an increase in technical or scientific expertise related to the Copernicus or Earth observation within the uh, public administration itself for more than 75 percent of respondents. While in societal domain, improvements in public awareness, for example, were made about societal and climate threats for more than 50 percent. This was just a glance. More information is coming along. We have also investigated challenges and achievements. Arthur was interested and he was actually surprised to, to learn that these applications are actually used. Well, of course, I stated that in, since 2018, more than 60% of respondents confirmed that their solution passed to the higher user maturity level. We should mention some main obstacle to the solution advancements in case that the solution remains at the same stage of user maturity level. We have, we have identified quite a few reasons for this without respondents, but th those most important for public administration could be the necessary administrative process still to be finalized or that activities are in standby because validation is still ongoing. Some main success parameters were also identified for those solutions that have been uptaken. For example, new space funds were allocated to take the space-based solutions into territorial practices for many examples, while increased awareness about Copernicus program and increased recognition about the effectiveness of the solution at the decision-making level was met. I also left some testimonials on both challenges and achievement to Arthur. For example, another colleague from a large European municipality has stated that by means of Earth Observation Copernicus data, their municipality is taking part in the steering committee of the EU Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Communities. They hope to identify unmet needs and ways to help encourage the use of EU data in this way. By this time, Arthur was a little bit tired and overwhelmed, so I wanted to sum up some first findings for him. Basically, we have found that Copernicus-based solutions can help to increase efficiency in the public administration. They can also foster innovation in the functioning of the public administration and facilitate common understanding across different entities. They can stimulate development of in-house competencies in EU domain as well. Some main challenges encountered were the necessity of administrative processes to be finalized and validations that are still ongoing. Some main factors for, for progress recognized were awareness about Copernicus program and recognition of Copernicus-based solutions even at the decision-making level. Much more information is of course upcoming in the report. I invited Arthur to stay tuned.
But before saying goodbye to Arthur, I invited him to submit his user story that is still missing. So if you have this in common with Arthur, you can still take action following the link that you can see on your screens here. I thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, please ask Arthur. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, and we are pleased to have with us today, Dr. Kuka. Um, I'll take a brief pause uh, to see if we have any questions from the floor uh, and we can address those now. And then you can also add them and we'll circle back with them later if you uh, don't have them at the moment. So uh, just a pause for questions. Okay, so uh, do feel free to add questions as we go. Um, but thank you very much for being with us here today, Dr. Kuka. Um, next, we have a series. Oh, sorry. <laughs> next, we have a series of short presentations on the real-world use cases of Copernicus in a variety of domains. Um, for here, we'll go in two rounds. So we'll do a few presentations and then take questions, and then we'll do a few more and take questions again. Um, first off, we have a video presentation on local Copernicus demonstrator in Brittany uh, for regional regional Copernicus um, by for Fabrice Fong from Gia Breton, a project leader, uh, regional directorate for the environment, development, and housing uh, in Brittany, along with uh, Marie Jagaille uh, from GIS Bretel in Brittany, France. Uh, so over to you. Les régions françaises doivent développer des politiques environnementales dans la perspective du changement climatique. Toute donnée contribuant à un meilleur suivi environnemental est bien évidemment la bienvenue. La question est, les données satellites sont-elles activables facilement par des agents publics qui ne sont pas experts Le constat est que ce n'est pas toujours le cas. Vous avez besoin de compétences, de logiciels, de puissance de calcul. C'est dommage parce que, en tant qu'agent public, vous pourriez déjà satisfaire vos premiers besoins si vous aviez simplement accès à l'image satellite d'hier facilement depuis vos outils habituels. Le challenge est donc de réduire franchement le coût d'accès aux données spatiales, d'abord en les rendant facilement découvrables, aussi facilement que les autres données, ensuite en permettant aux utilisateurs de les injecter dans leurs outils du quotidien, sans changer leurs habitudes, à la demande, sans avoir à demander à un expert. La solution proposée au niveau régional est le développement de démonstrateurs locaux innovants dans le contexte de la démarche Copernicus régionale. Elle implique des groupes de travail composés d'utilisateurs volontaires au sein des administrations et institutions, de fournisseurs de services comme des laboratoires de recherche ou des entreprises et d'un animateur ou facilitateur, le groupe membre tel. L'approche Copernicus régionale continue aujourd'hui en Bretagne et aboutit à une innovation sociale sur la perception des données satellites. Nous avons maintenant 20 produits spatiaux dont le coût d'accès a été considérablement réduit. Ça veut dire que pour ces 20 produits, 3 clics suffisent pour trouver des images et pour les ajouter par-dessus vos données dans un navigateur, donc sans outils spatiaux. L'accès à ces données satellites est le même que l'accès aux autres données de zonage, de planification, de suivi de projet. Donc ce n'est plus une donnée de spécialiste, elle est banalisée, elle devient une donnée comme les autres. Et très important pour l'éthique politique environnementale, tout le monde y a accès de la même façon. Les agents publics, mais également le secteur privé et la population. Et ce qui est important, c'est que tout le monde soit en capacité de voir la même chose pour pouvoir encore engager un débat. Donc nous avons réduit le coût d'accès aux données et nous constatons qu'un changement social important se produit qui installe une nouvelle situation. Les utilisateurs finaux commencent à fabriquer leur propre cas d'usage et continuent à développer ces usages. Par exemple, un chargé de mission va vouloir vérifier la végétation autour d'un projet qu'il a examiné, la végétation de l'année dernière, pour vérifier une politique environnementale. Mais aujourd'hui, ça ne demande pas de faire appel à un spécialiste de la donnée. Il peut le faire. Il va sans doute penser ensuite à d'autres cas d'utilisation. Comme évolution de notre solution technique, avec nos partenaires, nous avons développé différentes applications en ligne. Un outil générique, la plateforme Copernicus Régional. Un outil à destination du grand public et des enfants vue de l'espace, et un démonstrateur thématique sur les zones côtières litovises. 
Pour pouvoir dans le futur développer des usages complexes autour de la télédétection, il faut d'abord diffuser des cas simples. C'est pourquoi il faut aujourd'hui mettre de l'énergie dans l'accompagnement des acteurs locaux. Pour cela, nous devons continuer à rendre l'image satellite visible pour tout le monde au travers de démonstrateurs thématiques en réponse à des enjeux du territoire dans l'actualité et pour différentes communautés professionnelles qui sont variées et qui ont des besoins différents. Ceci avant de développer une culture commune de la télédétection et à générer une demande de cas plus complexe. Thank you very much uh, for the video presentation, Fabrice and Marie. Uh, and, and we're very happy to have with us Marie uh, live today. Um, Marie, would you like to add any additional remarks? Uh, I just would like to say that this is a, a, a work in progress and we have to work every day with our local users to use all the potential of the Copernicus images and services. Fantastic. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and we next up, uh, we have uh, Francisco Wallenstein uh, from the government of the Azores Space Mission, who has a presentation for us on uh, the user experience, the potential of a pre-commercial procurement approach in Earth observation, uh, which has contributed to shape the Azorean space strategy. Uh, so over to you, Francisco. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here to Nereus. Uh, who, to whom the Azores uh, are a founding members since the beginning. And indeed, the, um, what brings me here, not a video and not a PowerPoint uh, support, but uh, I will just give you briefly my experience with, or the Azores region's experience with, with uh, Copernicus. And um, indeed, digital, tr digital transition drive and Copernicus resources are a good match for, for innovation in public administration. and. For the Azores and the Copernicus program, uh, we started in 2015 with Nereus and the European Space Agency with a workshop trying to find out uh, what were the, the specificities of small oceanic islands in the use of Sentinel data. And we reached the conclusion that within the pool of people that were present, which was quite a big audience, about 50 people from different departments, there was not much experience. Uh, with Copernicus data and difficulty in getting and using these data. So, based on that, we we set on a strategy, uh, set on move a strategy to try to overcome this uh, in several ways. We developed uh, a training session uh, for local and regional administration departments in 2017, and at the same time, being of a quite maritime region, uh, I decided to go through around the, the, the departments in the, in, the, in the public administration regarding the sea affairs, trying to identify needs to, to go for a call that was going on, which was a pre-commercial procuring, procurement call. It was the first time that in space this, was, this type of call was being open. And we ended up entering a consortium and uh, we uh, entered a, a project called Marine EO, Marine Earth Observation. And um, through the process of entering this, this uh, kind of, of call or pro pre-commercial procurement, we learned uh, in the process to identify what the needs were for the region what there exists to meet these needs in terms of offering uh, based on space of uh, earth observation data where these offerings fail to meet our needs and what was needed to overcome this shortage so um, uh, the the process funded uh, research in companies to develop the prototypes to meet these needs and um, what we gained in the public administration was the experience in earth observation based service acquisition and understanding how these uh, uh, are co costed and, and what are the constraints of developing the, the, the solutions for the needs that we have. Um, the final results were prototypes and at the end the problem is that no budget 
uh, was there to, to fund further development of these prototypes to then be adopted for, for public administration and, and, and go on with, with innovation. So um, the, the, the final, the final, um, the final uh, learning from, from this process uh, turned into a public consultation to build up the strategy of resource for space on its uh, priority, priority area one, which is development of applications based on spatial data. And um, to ensure that innovation occurs in delivery of public policies with the uptake of Copernicus at the level of public administration, in my opinion, it requires persistence in identifying the needs within public administration, providing training for, for, for officers, support their use and uh, continue budget allocation for internal development or for acquisition of earth observation services and products. So this is what I had for you and if there are any questions about this process I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much Francisco um, and up next also from the Azores we have a video message from Dr. Suzette Amaro Secretary of Culture for Science and Digital Transition of the Regional Government of the Azores. Dear Madams and Sirs, let me in the first place apologize for participating in video forum instead of in person. This was due to an agenda incompatibility that I've been able to reschedule. As a member of the Azores Regional Government responsible for space and digital transition affairs, alongside with culture and science and technology, I am delighted to take part of this webinar focused on how Copernicus helps Europe's regions to innovate public administrations and the delivery of public policies. Space has been a strategic sector for the Azores since the beginning of the new millennium, whereby investment has allowed for the emergence of several space-related activities in our territory. The Azores host ground segments in features of all major European space-related programs, Copernicus, Galileo, Amstad and EU SST, as well as of other networks of global importance such as RIEG, the Atlantic Network of Geodynamic and Spatial Stations and the Atmospheric Radiation Measure Measurement User Facility. This is why the Azores government adhered in 2007 as a founding member to NREUS, the network of regions using space technologies and in 2017 to the Copernicus Relay Network as its inception. We are aware of the importance of Earth observation data, as well as satellite-based positioning and communications and derived services for the modernization of public services and for enhancing public policies' efficacy. Promoting the adoption of such resources within our local and regional authorities is a natural way to align with the green and digital transitions. This is the reason why, in the recently published Strategy of Azores for Space, we have defined the development of application based on space data as one of the five priority areas to achieve the three main objectives of the strategy, which are economic growth, build capacity and increase visibility. Within the implementation of the strategic of Azores for Space, we plan to become an example of other regions regarding the uptake of Copernicus within our public administration towards innovation in the delivery of public service and policies. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Um, with great appreciation to Dr. Amaro. Uh, we'd like to now open the floor for questions uh, for what we've discussed so far. Uh, so please do add those to the chat. Um, and we already have a couple. Um, so both of these are for uh, Dr. Kuka. We'd like to ask you, first of all, 
um, you know, is, is the questionnaire still live and available? Uh, or, or are there other ways to contribute? Uh, and secondly, do you, what are your views uh, regarding the continuity of people involved in the case studies? Are they the same people who were involved three years ago? And how much and how many have changed? Uh, yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first uh, reply to the first question. Yes, the questionnaire is still open. So if you are one of the authors from the let's say from the audience uh, watching us, uh, please go ahead and, and reply. We will be happy to update your answers uh, still. Um, regarding the second question uh, on the continuity of the people involved. Uh, yes, well, we have noticed some uh, some changes. You have to think that uh, back in 2018, uh, almost half of the stories that we received was at user maturity level three, uh, that is to say pilot and experimental tester um, as, as examples. So uh, these were pro uh, stories usually coming from projects. And this is where we noted most of the changes when the project uh, would, would finish, uh, people working on that project or uh, on that user story would change. In some cases, we had indications uh, of colleagues uh, now taking over and then how to get in touch with them. But in some cases, uh, this, this was not possible. Uh, as well as in, uh, let's say, changing stuff at the, at the public administration level. And in, in some cases, that this had uh, influenced the, the continuity as well. I hope that answers the question. Very much so. Um, and, and thank you very much to Ionas Gitas and, and Jeff Sawyer for those questions. Um, holding for a few more questions, if you have anything else that you'd like to know from any of our speakers, please do feel free to add those and we'll be sure to get to them. So for now, I'll move on, but you can feel free to continue to add those and we'll circle back. Um, so moving on to our second round of presentation, we will have a video presentation on a space-based solution for oil spill detection uh, presented by Anastasia Monzidou from the Center of Research and Technology in Halas, uh, along with Ionas Leombas, pardon me, and Katrina, uh, Katerina Kristen Dulu. Uh, from Thessaloniki Water Supply and Sewage Company. So over to you. The challenge back in 2018, as described in the article A Space-Based Solution for Oil Spill Detection, involves, involved countries with large seawater areas or extended coastlines that have to deal with the challenging issue of promptly detecting and reacting to events of marine pollution in order to minimize the environmental effects. At that time, the solution involved the collection of satellite images and specifically SAR images from the Mediterranean Sea and produced detection masks with oil spills and lookalikes. However, our organization deemed necessary to advance the solution as new challenges appeared. While in the past we were talking for oil spill detection on sea waters, now we are focused on the detection of irregular formations on the reservoir that provides water to more than 1 million people at the Thessaloniki water area. This reservoir is the artificial lake of Polyphytos, which is the main source of drinking water for Thessaloniki city. The challenges include frequent monitor and assess the lake's surface water physical chemical characteristics and to optimize our company's water sampling procedures. In the technical solution of this use case, we use Sentinel-2 images. The application automatically discovers and downloads Sentinel-2 data for the area of interest, processes them and produces georeferenced masks that capture irregular formations on lake surface. The users are being informed through and are able to check the produced masks in the friendly GUI of the solution. Concerning the benefits, this includes scientific benefits, which are novel methodology developed to detect irregular formations in inland waters and research initiated to offer methods to discriminate the type of formations observed on water surface. The benefits of economic impact include optimize the sources related to sampling procedures and to avoid additional sources 
that are necessary for treating extra contaminated water. The societal impact includes to further enhance the water safety procedures that are related to treating water supply to more than 1 million citizens. We currently continue to work on the Copernicus-based tools and we plan to include them in our organization operational procedures. Fantastic presentation, and we are happy to have Anastasia and Ionis here with us today. I'd like to turn the floor over to you for any additional remarks. I don't have anything to add other than that this work is in progress, and uh, as uh, it was mentioned by Janis Lubas. We are currently working and uh, uh, checking also uh, methods to improve the results so that it can be actually incorporated uh, into AIAT's um, internal procedures. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, we uh, are happy to have you both with us today. And if, you, anybody, if anybody in the audience has any questions, please feel free to add those. Um, and in the meantime, we will move on to our next use case on agriculture monitoring using Sentinel images. Um, and with us uh, to present, we have Amelie Barreau from the Walloon Agricultural Research Center. Uh, over to you, Amelie. <clears throat> Thank you. So I think that you will share my slides. Or do you hear me? Yep. Yes. So. Oh, okay, my slide is there. Okay, so my name is Emily Berriot. So as um, you said, I work at the Walloon Agricultural Research Center in Belgium. And I'm going to present the work of my colleagues and myself about agricultural monitoring using, using Sentinel images. This is the work of both the um, Walloon Paying Agency and the Walloon Agricultural Research Center. Next slide, please. So the Walloon Paying Agency <coughs> manages different schemes relating to the common agricultural policy and is in charge of evolving toward the new check by monitoring and area monitoring systems. This evolution of the policy aims at moving from a compliance system to a performance system and involves a continuous crop monitoring in order to process the farmer's payments. One of the main tasks to evolve to the check by monitoring system is to define specific and useful objective reachables, reachable thanks to the existing technologies. Next slide, please. So in this context, the Copernicus program offers really useful data in order to continuously monitor the agriculture over Wallonia. Indeed, the EO Copernicus program provides high-resolution Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 satellite imagery, and the Walud, Walud re region is covered by a two to five days revisit period for the Sentinel-2 sensors and a two-day revisit period for the Sentinel-1 sensors. Uh, next. High temporal and 10 to 20 meter resolution imagery allows to monitor over the time agricultural at parcel level in most of the Walloon fields. More, more specifically, time series of indices or signals extracted from both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images at parcel level allows to generate crop maps, to detect ineligible elements, and um, to detect the evolution of plot delineation and agricultural practices. Next slide, please. Our story evolves. So, two new objectives have been defined since the beginning of our story. The identification of agricultural practice, practices such as mowing, covered restriction, and bare soil TH detection, and the urban elements detection inside agricultural parcels. 
Moreover, our story evolves from research to an operational use. Thus, the methods developed by researchers are then automated and used operationally by the paying agency who shares to, to the farmers useful information when they apply for their aids. Next slide, please. To conclude, uh, both Sentinel-1 and 2 data are used to generate crop maps to detect changes and identify agricultural practices in agricultural parcels. The compilation of each Sentinel-derived product is implemented in the Walloon Paying Agency in the framework of the new check by monitoring system of the CAP. And the, um, the entire chain runs continuously during the subsequent crop seasons. You can see on the slide an example of achievement. The research result, results leads to a um, tool used by the farmers on the geospatial head application. The new deline delineation of a field appears automatically while the farmer applies for his head. Next slide, please. And for the future, um, it's sure that um, we have still to improve the quality of the results. So this is still a challenge. And especially in the small parcels, to address this issue, other Earth observation data should be used jointly with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images, such as um, aerial photos or very high spatial resolution satellite imagery. So we can see on the slide that in some small parcels, no Sentinel Pixel, pixel 2 falls uh, entirely within the polygon. Uh, moreover, over other products should be achieved to monitor this additional schemes, notably schemes from the second pillar. Next slide, please. <laughs> and that's it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, and finally, before taking more questions, um, so do add those if you have some questions for our speakers, I'd like to welcome Member of Parliament, Member of European Parliament, Svet Svetlina Penkova, to discuss and provide remarks on her views on public sector innovation. Hi, I hope you can hear me and you would see me shortly. Yes, okay. perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the very interesting uh, event presentations and remarks made uh, by uh, all the presenters and uh, some of my colleagues uh, uh, at the beginning. So um, I will just try to put some perspective in terms of how we see the, the importance of the, the technology and like I will try to put it into perspective with the, the specifics of some of the work uh, I'm doing in the European Parliament. So, um, first of all, I would start by saying that I think we all understand that um, we would not be able to achieve the resource efficiency and the targets that we've put in the Green Deal only um, if we are relying on some political will to deliver those results. So, we need something more than that. Um, and I think uh, the fact that we have an access to reliable and constant uh, earth monitoring data uh, is amazing because in that uh, matter, in that manner, we can access our progress, uh, draw the political priorities, and uh, most importantly, take uh, science-based decisions. Um, in um, the pandemic, actually, just before the pandemic, um, I was um, I was working um, on the long-term um, strategy for uh, the EU industrial future, uh, where one of the key priorities at that point was how uh, we're going to achieve a strategic uh, independence of the EU of some of the key industry industries uh, where we currently rely on some of the um, outside suppliers and in that case we do jeopardize our ability to generate domestic growth. I think the pandemic had put the spotlight um, precisely on that problem and uh, it did show us that we need to develop even more our domestic capabilities. Uh, and therefore, this industrial strategy is, um, is going to go through an update in the coming months. So initially, when I was working on that, um, I was looking at it from the perspective of my work at the Regional Development Committee. 
So we were trying to uh, reduce the inequalities between the EU regions. Uh, this time, I'm working on the industrial strategy as a member of the Committee on Industry Research um, and Energy. And uh, I'll be focusing mostly on the industrial aspect, or in other words, how uh, we can increase the involvement of our SMEs uh, in the economic uh, growth of the EU. Why am I saying all that? Um, so if, um, uh, if we want to invest and in, uh, to promote the development of um, our innovative SMEs, uh, we need to fuel our uh, digital economy with data. And uh, as I saw it in my initial remarks, I think the fact that we have reliable and constant earth monitoring data is going to be part of that solution, how we can uh, support our innovative SMEs and how we can make them more competitive on the, on the global market. Uh, Copernicus had uh, has already uh, proven uh, the, uh, the crucial, has already provided crucial uh, earth monitoring, and it is serving for the needs of the citizens. Uh, so in terms of the, the most obvious benefits we see, I would probably identify two, uh, two aspects in that matter. First of all, is the favor favorable conditions for um, installing uh, renewable energy sources, which would support our targets on the Green Deal. And uh, secondly, it monitors the EU um, external borders. So those benefits combined with our goal to promote and to help the growth of our SMEs, I think there is a very clear symbiosis in terms of how we can produce and deploy European space infrastructure, uh, which allows an easy and cheap access to data for our SMEs. Uh, this would help, of course, create jobs, improve technological skills, and boost the EU competitiveness overall. I think it's needless to say that the space economy is uh, growing rapidly and it, uh, the trend is expected to remain upwards in the future. Uh, Europe has uh, the, the second largest space industry in the world and we're employing more than 230,000 uh, uh, professionals. Uh, the, the, the worth of this industry is expected to be worth uh, about 60, 60 billion euros. So the numbers speak for themselves in terms of that we have already created the capacities and we already see the benefits in the use. So now it's a time to, to create that symbiosis that's going to help, uh, help our economic growth together with the Green Deal and together with the, um, with the collaborative work with the um, uh, innovative SMEs that we have um, in Europe. Of course, there are other European programs which are worth mentioning here, um, like Horizon uh, 2020 program that's now um, Horizon Europe would uh, would provide uh, more opportunities for that. And it does provide financing for all of the stakeholders when we're speaking about research and um, innovation. I think I'll conclude by saying something I've been observing in my um, in my work, um, both in the Parliament and like outside when I'm uh, when I'm back home or like traveling across the EU, speaking with citizens. Um, it seems that citizens um, quite often uh, overlook the space technologies uh, because uh, they do not think often about the technological processes behind, they, they don't understand the capabilities the EU had built um, in that field. So I, I, I genuinely think that forums like the one we're attending today uh, would raise the media profile and put the spotlight of the everyday benefit of the space technology. And of course, the fact that we are burden up in the scale of uh, developments and some of the goals we can achieve, um, especially in the in the space field. So um, the, the projects we, we hear about are um, a clear and an obvious indicator that basically um, every euro invest creates a real added benefit uh, for our society. 
And I genuinely hope that um, events like this one would help us promote it better and create a more clear understanding in our society for the importance of that and get actually a bit more uh, involvement. So I hope uh, we're going to have um, many similar events in the future. I hope I didn't speak for too long and I've tried to touch upon some of the most important aspects. Of course, uh, the, the topic is uh, so interesting and engaging that uh, we could speak for hours, but I will, I will stop here because um, I want to stick to the, to the schedule. And thank you so much for having me and for organizing. And I, I genuinely... I genuinely believe that uh, this is uh, this is the way to go further and provide more information and actually uh, be be confident and proud of uh, what we've achieved and what we can uh, achieve going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, MEP Penkova. Um, uh, I, I have a bit of a question it, it, at the OECD and at the observatory in particular. We're we're focusing more and more on um, kind of. Uh, transnational and interregional cooperation and collaboration. Um, so I, I would like to open it up to the speakers if anybody has any views on, um, you know, with with or beyond the uh, Copernicus for Regions initiative, um, if you're working a lot with other member partners or uh, other countries and, and how, what are the success factors that have um, been really instrumental in making these kinds of um, regional interregional partnerships work? If anyone has thoughts on that. All right, well, I might hit you up after. Oh, go. Uh, yes, please, Fran Francisco. Well, not being working with any other regions uh, regarding the implementation of, of uh, practices of use of Copernicus in public administration, I do think that the, the programs that fund joint projects would be a very useful tool to um, to try to bring good practice from regions that are already using uh, Copernicus tools within public administration to others that are not. Uh, so I leave I leave here the, the challenge of Tunereus uh, to maybe mobilize uh, regions to work together in, in such exchange programs which would really benefit um, at least uh, decision makers to understand how they could promote the, the, the use of Copernicus for public, public policy development and reporting, for example. I think it would be very important to have um, tools that would identify how Copernicus could be used to report on EU directives, for example, because in public administration, lots of uh, officers are dealing with with providing report on on the implementation of some of some uh, um, some data on the implementation of directives, and it would be very useful, for example, to to have some idea how this uh, how Copernicus uh, services could evolve uh, to help this kind of of uh, of work. So yes, I think it would be very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Um, and for Dr. Kuka, we have a question from the floor, um, a bit of a, a, a observation and oh, was, uh, someone curious to get your reaction. So from Jeff Sawyer, he says that um, he uh, started looking for oil spills with Sentinel-1 and ended up looking at water quality with Sentinel-2, um, uh, or an observation from the Greece story supports the maxim that you need to be in the game to win it, uh, and, and saw several lessons from the things that he's heard today and wondered if you've, you've seen this effect in, in other types of cases. So I suppose, you know, it sounds like it's kind of the initiation to, to Copernicus and, and uh, being in it when you can realize its full power and potential synergies with, with other aspects of Copernicus. Yes, uh, thank you. I think it's also a great message to, to our colleagues from Greece. I hope you can hear me like this. Uh, yes, actually, we have seen um, some uh, examples of this kind. Of course, this uh, is, is a specific case uh, where our colleagues have moved from one topic to another uh, using, using, let's say, the same tool or integrating, actually, uh, another topic into their existing solution. Um, there are um, some solutions of this kind, uh, let's say, um, 
uptaking the, the um, solution that was presented for other problems. Uh, for example, we I remember a case of the uh, switch system solution monitoring that uh, thanks to those results, um, they were able to provide also um, information in other domains like climate adaptation, uh, near real-time monitoring of ground motion above the gas reservoirs, uh, risk-based assessment, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is just to, to pick up on uh, on Mr. Sawyer's uh, question, it was also um, possible, and the author stated that, thanks to the engagement of the public authorities. Uh, they had a very good uh, response uh, in the public authorities uh, and, uh, let's say, the willingness to uh, uptake and to, um, let me say, experiment uh, with them as well. I think, I hope this is, uh, this goes in, in direction of your question. Thank you very, very much. Um, open it up for any last questions that come from the floor uh, or any last remarks that any of the speakers would like to make based on what they've heard. All right, no questions from the chat. Um, so this has been a, a, a very interesting and, uh, and practical discussion for me. Um, you know, at the OECD, we see a lot of initiatives and, and a, um, a lot of different uh, government practices, um, and this feels very tangible and hands-on and, uh, and really impactful, and, and we don't always see that, and it's been a, a really interesting exchange. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, for participating today. Um, I would love to thank um, like Roya and the team for having me. Um, uh, I, I, if I'd ask Roya if maybe you would be able to add um, the OPSI website to the chat. So if anybody ever wants to reach out to uh, us, that would be um, interesting as well. Um, but from, uh, from my perspective, this has been a, a very interesting discussion. So um, thank you all very much. And thanks for having me. And, and Roya, over to you if you want to say uh, provide any um, closing. Thank you, Jamie. I think our audience listened a lot of viewpoints and has a lot of food for thought. Um, we like by closing by thanking you. Um, we will briefly share the website of um, Copernicus for Regions with you so you can see where you can all access the valuable material. We want to keep in touch with the community we started to build with all the users. Um, we stay tuned with you. We will get you more information and continue our discussions uh, to promote a better user uptake in Europe. And with this, I wish you all a very good day. Bye. Here you see the publication, the teaser and the videos, the brochures, the info sheets, where you can also search with a search engine towards specific stories, different domains, sentinel, data, and maturity level. Okay, close. And close. Thank you, goodbye.